welcome to Understanding and Designing Safety Applications with Electric Supply and Equipment. Um, I'm Henry Gilliland. I'm the Motion Specialist with ES&E. Uh, here in the room with me I have uh, Eric Hanley. He is one of the uh, PLC specialists at ES&E. And then we also have uh, Paul Harrison. He's a technical consultant with Rockwell Automation. Um, joining us remotely today we have Eric Bombier. Um, and Greg Taylor. I'll let them introduce themselves here in a second. But first, I just want to go through a quick look at the topics of discussion for this morning. So first, we're going to go through a look at the safety standards and best practices for safety applications. Then we're going to look at the guard link and GuardMaster Ethernet Diagnostics platforms from Rockwell. Then we'll dive into a sort of an understanding of SIP safety as a communications protocol for networked safety. Specifically, we'll be talking about safety over Ethernet IP today. And then we'll look at several devices and platforms from Rockwell that use SIP safety. So we'll talk about guard logics, both software and hardware, talk about the SIP safety MAB, the SIP safety light curtains. We'll talk about some kinetics and PowerFlex advanced features. And then Paul Harrison will do a demonstration of a, an integrated safety system for you. And then at the very end, we'll just do a quick overview of the safety digital I.O. platforms that Rockwell offers as well. Without further delay, I'll turn it over to uh, Eric Bombier and Greg Taylor for a look at the safety standards and best practices for understanding and designing safety applications. Henry just shared a kind of a overview or agenda for the day. Here's a little bit more granularity or detail on our opening segment here that Greg and I will present on. And I'm Eric Bombier. I'm a solution consultant based in Dallas, and Greg is a business lead for the Carolinas and Virginia. We're going to kind of split up this introduction. We're going to give a little bit of discussion around risk assessment, but more around the engineering, the results, the choosing, the solutions, the architectures, the products involved. Just for context, I want to do a quick survey of the various standards that all of this stuff kind of pulls from. And the first kind of predominant standard is the 13849 part one, which is where categories and performance levels are defined and explained for applications. And then its sister or part two is the validation of systems that are designed around safety. So this is where we do things that electrical people sometimes cringe when we say pull a wire off while the system is running and observe the actions or short circuit two wires of say like a light curtain output together and be sure that the system performs as we expect. So that's the validation phase around performance levels. And then 62061 is kind of the same thing, although it's in terms of safety integrity levels or SIL. So they're companion standards. They're not conflicting. They're not contradicting. There was an initiative in underway to sort of merge these standards. My understanding is that initiative is now kind of on the back burner, but they do definitely uh, complement each other and, and they're, 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 we're going to talk about them both. There's a relatively new ANSI standard. So this is a, a U.S., North America or, or American standard, and it's called B11.26, and it clearly references and describes functional safety and in terms of 13849 part one. So just want to make the point, this is definitely in the ANSI language. This is not just for Europe anymore, so to speak. This is definitely part of the, the American engineering standards. ANSI B11.0 was just updated and released about a year ago. This is the basis of risk assessment methodologies and some of the overall system design. So this is a very useful standard to know and use. And then B1119 is a little more granular technical detail about specific safeguarding means and some about the functional safety design. Not so much into specifics of wiring, that's some other standards. And then a very well-known and used standard is the ANSI Robotics Industry Association standard, which is actually now, I think, merged or harmonized fully with the ISO standards for robotics. And then, of course, NFPA 79, that defines and describes some of the wiring practices and then things like the National Electrical Code. So all of these standards are important in the engineering context. They're organized into three types or levels. Type A would be 
the kind of broadest reaching. Maybe it applies to quote unquote all machinery. The intention is that the risk assessment standards and approaches are some foundational principles. And then the B type standards are more to some specifics around engineering approaches, like uh, applying performance levels and categories. And then the C type standards are more specific to a type of machinery, such as a robot or a press, et cetera. So just a quick flip through. Some of these things are kind of new and developing and evolving. This late last one listed is around industrial mobile robots. So things like maybe an articulated arm on top of a moving autonomous or other guided type system. Just in context around various machine type hazards, guarding, and examples, OSHA is very clear in a way in that they require guarding. They give some examples and some guidance on what guarding is and how it should be done, but they don't give a lot of detail um, in some cases. But OSHA is very clear on two things, guarding and then lockout tagout. There's kind of a an area in between from a lockout tagout standpoint where we have to have lockout tagout, no question. We have to have it. And we have to use lockout and tag out for certain tasks and procedures, but some routine, repetitive, and integral type tasks could be implemented without having to use lockout, tag out, as long as we have effective protection, guarding, et cetera. And we also have to have emergency stop, but emergency stop is really not a safeguarding type of device or function. It's a separate function. Now, it might be wired together, no question. Many systems, emergency stop and safety devices and guarding interlocks, et cetera, are wired together. But in the standards and the engineering approaches today, it's really a different scenario. And same thing applies to a pull cord switch. These things are really just emergency stop devices. They're really not a safeguarding device. So think about that in, I guess, different contexts. So here's a real typical this could be as much as maybe at least 20 years old, but still current today. This is a, a safety interlock circuit. This is in the electrical controls engineers language. This is stuff like I've got a safety guard switch over here. I've got a redundant contacts here so that if this wire falls off uh, or breaks, we know about it because we've got two sets of contacts. If if this wire were to short circuit to, to ground, we know about it and we can take action. Likewise, on the outputs, we've got two contacts in series. If this welds shut, then this one will still open and this normally closed aux will stay open and uh, we won't be able to reset the system. So this is a this is a good system. This is a good safety design. The question is, is it safe enough? Is that redundancy and that level of device selection, or maybe is it over-designed? In other words, did we spend too much money in devices and wiring and, and figuring out that level? And not to mention here, we've got electromechanical devices, contactors, maybe relays, solenoids. These things have wear and tear. And so the question now is, is it safe enough for long enough? If we've designed this safety system on this machine to be used for 20 years, say, can we be sure it's safe enough for long enough? Or in other words, what's the likelihood, what's the percentage or statistical likelihood that this safety system will work when it's needed to keep our workers safe? And then likewise, maybe a more modern approach that you'll be covering a bit, a lot more today. What if we have things like ethernet and software and electronics? And again, how do we look for redundancy? I don't see two wires here and there. We've got Ethernet networking. So the question is still, is this system safe enough? Or was it over-designed? And when we have electronics, can we be sure, is it safe enough for long enough? And again, statistical calculations come into play. So the only way to answer those questions is to really follow the safety life cycle, starting with the risk assessment. And engineers, controls people, we tend to be maybe a little impatient and we want to jump in and get down to the drawing board and start picking out products and designing the circuits and wiring up. But 
that's really not the right place to start. We don't want to start engineering until we followed a rigorous, a thorough risk assessment, designing or defining their requirements, and then go on to the engineering. Verification is actually when we're going to calculate and figure out, did our design satisfy the requirements from the assessment? And then validation, we mentioned just earlier, that's when we do terrible things like introduce faults in the system and make sure that it behaves properly. So just in context where some of these different stages are described and defined, I've, I've mapped together these various standard references. So no one standard kind of thoroughly covers the entire process. And again, depending what types of machinery, what types of uh, robot cells or whatever, it would maybe involve different standards. But this is kind of a representative of that process. The idea of the risk assessment is to study the machine, see what's needed, speeds, directions, different different types of aspects of the equipment itself. How fast does it go? How far does it reach? What kind of forces are involved? And then the key is to identify the tasks with the hazards associated. So what are we going to have people do? Are they going to open up and clear a jam? Are they going to make some adjustments? Are they going to realign things? So we want to define the tasks and the hazards and then associate that with a score of risk. And there's different ways to represent it. It doesn't tell us exactly how we have to do it, but some different methods are offered. And once we score that risk, we decide if it's acceptable or if it's too high. And if it's too high, we want to decide on some ways to reduce the risk. And the hierarchy of reduction starts with design it out, if we can eliminate that hazard, or control that hazard with engineering controls. And that's where we come in to things like light curtains and guard door switches and safety relays and servos and drives and all that. So that's where we're kind of looking here. You notice as you go down the list, you get to things like lock out, tag out, which is really a administrative control. Now it's certainly safe when used properly. We're isolating energy, but it is an administrative control, meaning somebody has to do it and manage it and supervise it. So the preferred way is what we're talking about here with functional safety. So just a little bit about the standards and what engineering controls or functional safety. This section from B110 says, where feasible engineering controls shall be provided to reduce risk. So it is the responsibility of the machinery designing, engineering controls, engineering to address this. And relatively speaking, it's understood that it can't always be eliminated, the hazards. So guards, devices, and administrative controls will probably be used together. Assessing a risk is, again, a combination of how severe of an injury could occur and what's the probability that that will happen. Severity could be described with injury types, scratches, lacerations, amputations, et cetera. And then the probability is sometimes a combination of exposure, like how often or how long will somebody be exposed, and avoidance. So can they easily avoid it? Or is it moving so fast you couldn't, you couldn't get out of the way? And this is one method. This is not what the standards say we have to do, but this is a method that the Rockwell risk and safety consultants are using unless somebody asks us to use something else. And this factors in those same pieces, the injury, how, how severe of an injury with a numeric scale, and the probability that it will happen, and the frequency or exposure of that hazard. And then it also factors in how many people are we talking about? So most machinery, we're often talking about one or maybe two people. But if it's a more complex or maybe bigger or aligned, there could be more people. And so we just take those numeric values, multiply them together to get the hazard rating number. Then we assigned a range of numbers to what's acceptable or negligible uh, um, through unacceptable. And then we define what are we gonna do about that to reduce that, that risk. And so if we're using functional safety, which this is the formal definition taken from 61508, it's the part of the system under control, the electrical, electronic, and programmable electronic systems. In other words, 
we're using automation to protect people is the big picture. And just to wrap up then the risk assessment, when we're using functional safety, we have to map the outcome of the risk level to a requirement of how rigorous the safety control system will be designed and work. And this is one method that comes from that 13849 standard. By the way, it's in Annex A, which is an informative annex. So the standard doesn't say we have to do it exactly like this, but it offers this as one method so that if we have a serious injury, but infrequent exposure, and you could probably avoid it, then that would be a performance level requirement of C to design our system to. Here's another one that I think is probably getting a lot more traction, especially in the robotics applications. This has three levels of injury, so minor, moderate, and serious, and we'll look at those definitions next. It has initially two levels of exposure, just low and high, and they're defined. And then after we implement our safeguards, we could use zero, meaning it's been prevented by the use of safeguarding. And then three levels of avoidance, likely, not likely, or not possible. So let's look at those definitions briefly. Here they define um, injury severities. So minor might be like first aid. Moderate could be defined as normally reversible, like a broken bone normally heals and lacerations normally heal. You might need stitches, et cetera. And then serious would be non-reversible, something like an amputation or worse. So those are defined. And then the exposure is defined as low, meaning it doesn't, it's not very frequent, maybe less than once a day even. And then high would be more frequent. And then avoidance, a lot of times, especially with robotics, maybe it comes down to speed. So speed and distances and, and how much space somebody has. So again, to that technical report, those three factors go in and we'd say if we had moderate injuries could occur and it's high exposure and it's not likely to get out of the way, then we'd have high. And the technical report also maps red or high to a performance level requirement of D and a category three design structure. And Greg's going to explain that in a bit more detail here coming up soon. But this is the this is a nice technical guide because it does provide some mapping of the risk assessment results to the circuit design requirement. And note that in robotics, typically performance level E is not as often required. And that's partly because of some of the guarding and safeguarding measures that are being implemented with it. That was step one, risk assessment. Step two is the functional requirements. And here's where we might start to describe how we want the safety system to work. So we'll describe it in brief language, maybe a, a couple of sentences, and we'll say what we want to happen. When that guard door is open, shut off power to that motor, for example. And we'll describe it in terms of inputs and logic and outputs. That's, that's the basis of functional safety. And Again, just a brief description. Here's a real example. When the e-stop button is pressed or the guard gate is opened, we'll stop hazardous motion. We might even describe safe torque off functionality of a power flex drive, for example. And we would do that functional safety description for each hazard we're addressing on the machine and tabulate it all together and describe a little more detail, maybe what category and what performance level or SIL will be addressed. So it's part of the safety functional documentation after the risk assessment. And then we go on towards the design. And we're going to design the safety system to match the requirements that we've developed. So the key thing is to always think in terms of input and logic and output. So we each of our tasks that we're protecting workers from, the hazards, we think about which input device, whether that's a light curtain or a guard door or an e-stop, et cetera, is being used to reduce the risk of each output that causes, let's say, um, motion or hazardous condition. The question kind of comes up, well, what do we really need to do? And 
the responsibility really lays with the designer, with the controls engineer, let's say, that if we're going to use these electrical and electronic type approaches to protect somebody, then we're responsible to design, verify the design, and then validate that system once it's built that it's adequate. So that's the responsibility of implementing functional safety. And then it comes up, well, how do we do that? How do we follow those standards? So we keep harping on thinking of combination of input and logic and output, and we've got to decide and just choose levels of redundancy. We talk about that with categories. Diagnostic and monitoring and coverage. So how many possible faults in the system, dangerous faults, can we design our system to automatically detect and take appropriate action? And we also got to think about the devices we choose. Are they quote unquote safety rated? Do they have good reliability from a safety standpoint? And then some other design criteria to help mitigate systematic faults or failures that could happen. One question often comes up is what are categories and how do they relate to performance levels? And then, well, what about SIL? or safety integrity levels. So you guys get a uh, lucky break now. I'm gonna be quiet and turn things over to Greg. Thank you, Eric. Yeah, we're gonna talk briefly here about the categories and how they relate to performance levels and the safety integrity levels uh, as well. And how, you know, which one do I choose? For years uh, in the United States here, we've used the EN 954, which has given us categories um, more recently over probably the past eight to 10 years, we've been introduced to something called performance levels, which comes from uh, the standard Eric showed earlier, 13849. And then also a lot of us are familiar with safety integrity levels or seal levels as we like to call them. And so we're gonna dive just a little bit into how they relate to one another. So first of all, as we look into what is a category of what we hope to do here in the next few slides is show you some examples of what those type of circuits look like. And what we will show you is basically what is the definition of these different type of categories. This particular piece comes out of uh, the standard 13849 uh, where it's defined for us there. And what I'll draw your attention to is where it talks about what the circuit will be consist of. And it basically says it'll be designed, constructed, selected, assembled, and combined in accordance with relevant standards and basic safety principles. So it sounds pretty simple. So as we look at what that circuit actually would look like, one thing you might notice as you look at this, these are just traditional control devices. You don't necessarily see, you know, you're probably asking, well, this is a safety circuit. Typically you're used to seeing devices that are red or some say yellow there, but anyway, in this particular, but you can achieve a very simple category B type structure with standard traditional control devices. And as we look at what a category one does for us, a little bit different. And again, I'll point out that what it says here is that it is in accordance with category B, but in addition to that, it talks about a couple of different things here. In particular, it says that these well-tried components should be used, so ones that are widely used and made and verified and suitable and reliable for safety-related applications. So again, what we start to introduce here is what you'll see in this example is some basic safety components. Again, maybe you ask yourself where you're we're missing something in this particular thing that Eric showed us what a safety function was, and that is the monitoring piece, if you would, in this particular example here, which would be like a safety relay or a safety PLC or something like that there. But as we move to category two, now you'll see, again, a little bit more different in that more demanding, if you would, it's still, again, at the top says there it's in accordance with the category B and where we'll use well-tried safety principles as well. But a couple more things that it requires you to do, and it's that the functions are checked at suitable intervals. And so it lists a couple of times like that. So machine startup is one, and then prior to initializing of any hazardous situation and or periodically, what it says there. 
And so what you'll notice from the, the circuit here is that yes, now we have added a safety relay into the mix. And so we get that monitoring piece now of what's going on. I can definitely have some the monitoring piece so I know what when a command is given to make sure that that command is applied to the, the output device as well. With category three, again, the standard still references that, you know, everything that we said for category B, and again, well-tried safety principles as well. But what it introduced here now is faults. And basically what it says is, is if I have a single fault in any of the parts, that it does not lead to the loss of the safety function. And so as an example, if you think about an emergency stop, typically we want to have at least two normally closed type contacts there. So if one of those contacts were to weld shut, for example, what this is telling us is that when someone were to press that emergency stop, yes, one of the contacts is welded, but the other one is not. So the relay at that point is monitoring independently both of those sets of contacts. And he gets a command from that e-stop and says, hey, listen, I got a command that I need to stop. And he's going to stop even though he only saw one of those two legs actually change state. So the ability to be able to monitor that is what we're adding in here. And so the dual channel part of that, as you see, the difference here is I've got two. You really want two on the input side. That particular switch that you see there has dual contacts inside of it. And then you have two separate uh, outputs as well with two safety contactors that you see there in the, the drawing. And then the last is category four. You want category four, again, says the same type of stuff in that the difference is, again, it says single fault detected or before the next command does, I do not, and a, an accumulation of undetected faults shall not lead to the loss of the safety function. So again, what we get here, as you look at the drawing ahead is when you introduce category four, you got, you look at that light curtain in particular there in the drawing, it has self-checking inside of it circuitry where it's continuously monitoring to make sure that the safety curtain is working itself. We also introduce things called test pulse in this category four type circuitry. So a lot of the components that we have that are rated category four have that self-checking capability or test posting capability where we're checking to make sure that that safety device is truly working like and acting like it's supposed to for that. So that's really the gist of the categories uh, piece of it there. So moving forward here, you'll see that this, you know, it, it's really important when we're talking and Eric kind of touched on it just briefly on the selection and design and verification piece of the safety life cycle. That is really important because you need to make sure that the devices that you're choosing are truly safety rated components. To Eric's point that he said there, we really have to verify that piece of it to make sure that they truly will do what they're supposed to do when, act, when called upon to, to serve in that purpose. Again, with performance levels, Eric, we talked about this with 13.849 he did, and we've got several customers who I would tell you that are more global type customers, and they started to look at performance levels or even using performance levels in lieu of the, the categories like we kind of talked about there. But what I want you to know, if you haven't really looked into performance levels itself, what 13.849 does is to calculate performance levels it's really a combination of the things that Eric mentioned there earlier, which is category. So it's all those categories that we just talked about. And then it's the mean time to fail dangerous. So you see the calculation there that's on the screen. Fortunately, most of the vendors, including us, we give you that data. We provide the mean time to failure data. If you look in the specifications of a safety component, that information is typically there. And then diagnostic coverage, as he mentioned earlier as well, that's another one that typically we give you that information, that calculations are already done for you, so you don't have to do that. And then common cause failures. Now, if you're using performance levels, when you're doing a risk assessment in particular, you, you really need to know what performance level is required. So you know what you're trying to make your, trying to get your circuit to be equal to. And so you use these different pieces to help you calculate that performance level that you're trying to achieve. So the little chart that you see there, now find that particular chart inside of 13849. And what that helps you do is when you take in consideration all those pieces, 
it will help you understand where in that performance level you fall. Now, as you can see, if we choose an example, performance level C, you'll notice that there's five different little slides that fall within that performance level C in particular. So there's a variety of things that could help me get into there depend based upon all those things that we have for things listed over there. So it helps us determine that. So how does the safety integrity levels relate to performance levels? And again, this chart comes out of 13849. And what you'll find is that there's a relationship, like Eric said, so they're not different of one another. They're very similar to each other. And so as an example, that performance level C, like we had mentioned just on the previous things, is really equivalent to like a SIL level one in particular, and so on down through the chart there itself. So again, th what we show in here in this little table is basically the two different things as you're looking at between performance levels in 13.849, and then also the SIL ratings, if you would, and the things that are required. So you kind of see there's kind of different terminologies there, yes, but they're very similar in what we're comparing and when we actually are doing the calculation. So like the slide says, it's very similar type outcomes. It's really just based upon the preference of the customer. Eric had mentioned this slide a little bit earlier as well, and the reason why we still put it in here is just to show you that even with these three different configuration of systems, we're still looking at SIL level three type devices and circuits with this particular functional safety control system that we have. So we can achieve those highest levels required within SIL as well as performance levels as well. So Greg, what if this Logix controller was only a SIL two, but we still had the rest of it as SIL three? What would our outcome be then? Where you can only achieve the highest level of the lowest rated piece within your circuit. So in that case, you could only achieve a SIL level two. And that's just like performance levels. That's just like categories across the board. So when you're doing performance levels, if you have done that in the past and done any kind of calculation, you know that you have to have proof of that, that you actually attain that particular score. And so there's some software tools that are out there today. One in particular is very popular is Systema. Systema is a third party based software that you would enter in all the necessary criteria. And with it, once you do that, it generates a report for you, which I think is, you know, here's a, an example of what that report will look like. And the nice thing about that is that, you know, it, it helps you understand where within your circuit you may have issues or if it truly does comply with that. And so what you want to be sure that you have is depending on the different vendors that you use, hopefully it's exclusively Alan Bradley, but I understand that maybe sometimes not. And in those situations, you want to make sure that you have, we have some files that we have created with the component data in them. And it's that mean time to fill dangerous and it's that diagnostic coverage. It's all those things that we have incorporated into ours is actually two files. I'm pretty sure that has all of our safety components in it. And you want to make sure that that resides within your folder on your computer for Systema. And what it'll do is in, when it is needing that particular data for those components that you're using, it'll reference to those files and it will pull and import and use those in the report itself when it's doing the calculation. And so then we're at step four at this point, and it's the installation and verification validation piece of it, which again, what we're showing here, it's important that this is documented. In your documentation here, you see an example of what that might look like, and it really should be a test step, a step-by-step -step piece of it, telling them exactly what they need to do to take these, to make sure that the components that we're using and the circuit that we have in place, when situation happens, that it truly will respond in the way that that we need to respond when we have faults to, to the circuit. Getting close here to the last slide, you know, Eric had showed us the, the safety life cycle a few times. And, and what we want to, to leave you with here is some tools and resources that Rockwell has in place today for you to use. And as you can see, for every step of the safety life cycle, we have software tools that you can reference and use in every single step of this. And we want to walk beside of you in that piece of it from, uh, and we're going to highlight a couple of things here that can help you as well. And so those things, we call them safety function documents. These safety function documents are, 
are fantastic. Some uh, as much as 75 to 80 pages long, I believe, uh, some of those where they give you a whole variety of things as you see listed there, the two, the like the bill of material, the wiring, the configuration and program. And we actually have attached some questions for you on the verification and the validation piece of it. What we're highlighting here is there's a little paper clip to the left side uh, that we've drawn an error to there for you because we've added a bunch of things in Adobe where you can click and get AutoCAD files and ePlan files, the Systema files that we talked about earlier. But then, like I said, even checklists for the verification and the validation piece. These are very thorough and done through documents. We've had many engineering friends who enjoy these particular files that we have in place. A lot of folks aren't familiar with these documents that we have, but again, there's over a hundred there now for you to be able to download, no cost for that at all. Uh, so we can help you with that. And there's a lot of other things on that web page too that you'll find as listed here. There's a bunch of white papers, videos, engineering resources, all kinds of tools that you'll find there. And, and again, those are all tools to help you along with this process as we're moving along with it. And also wanted to remind you that still is still going until June. If you didn't have a chance to do the automation fair this year at home, as we called it, since we couldn't meet in person this year, there are some classes that you can still go to view there. And we highlighted just a couple that were related to the safety piece of it there that you might want to consider going out and looking at. And again, you can still do that until June timeframe right now. And that's me and that's Eric. So that's our uh, information. So if you guys have questions. We actually did have one question pop up. Do you typically see SIL versus performance level in particular industries? As far as do you see maybe one one in, in one type of in industry more than the other or one type of application? Well, I'll take it easy way out and I'll say definitely in industries that are primarily or have some continuity with process control. So still was applied to process control systems for, for some decades and more recently for machinery systems. So in um, plants or industries where there's maybe a combination of some machinery, but also a lot of chemical safety hazard analysis, we tend to see still use there. And like that example Greg walked through earlier, if we had an all electronics system or largely electronics, like our new Ethernet light curtain and an Ethernet to the guard logics and maybe Ethernet to a servo, et cetera, then those things will probably each have a SIL rating and it's going to be easier in a way to just look at it and say, you know, what the SIL level of the system is. But the moment we start introducing electromechanical devices like solenoids and contactors and relays and stuff, there is no such thing as a SIL rated contactor. We have to do a mean time to dangerous failure calculation on it. And so it's going to kind of pull us back into the performance level methodology. Most of the time we, we see that a lot more predominantly in the process side of things. And to your point, so many times we're having to talk about a component level device and we just don't have many of those that have seal ratings in particular even though we showed a, a slide showing the, you know, the relationship, if you would, between them. But a lot of times the customers need an actual seal rating on something that, to be able to document that other than referenced to a standard like that. That's the only way we can get around that. So again, long way around to answer your question, to, to, to say very similar to what you see there, Eric. How do you evaluate a process system such as a kitchen area of a food plant this will be a system compromised of pumps, tanks, heat slash cool, and mixers. I don't know that a kitchen and that type of equipment um, um, necessarily or automatically would be kind of part of the requirements of the machinery that we're talking about. But let's just, for a, mat, for a moment, let, let's just say that we are going to consider it. I think it still comes down to what's the hazard and what's the exposure of people to that hazard. So how many people, how severe of an injury, how likely would it be to occur? 
and then decide what type of safety mitigation might be needed. I don't know if shutting everything off is always going to be the best answer. With a lot of machinery, maybe most machinery, most of the time, the safe state will be to shut things off. With process control and maybe some aspects of a kitchen, we don't want to necessarily shut everything off. For example, if we have maybe some ventilation that needs to come on, or if you kind of cross the bridge from machine safety into maybe flame safety or fire fire detection or, or control extinguishers, et cetera, maybe it's more important to turn things on or keep things running. So um, that might be a little different consideration than a, let's say, more of a typical industrial machine. And to be fair, Eric and I, our expertise is more around the machine guarding side of things. So just so you guys know, we do have a full team of process focused a team around specialists like that. We, we, we got a whole team of process safety type people that we can definitely link you up with to, to help better answer some of your other questions or you needs you have there. So j- just let us know that and we'll get that lined up. For you. I, I did have one more question uh, for you guys. So you, we're talking about devices that have um, specific performance levels and SIL levels. So where do those actual ratings come from? How, how does Rockwell achieve those ratings what what are they what's the process for having a device rated a certain performance level yeah sure so when you talk about a safety component how you get it rated is you really have to first of all a lot of testing you have to have a third party tested so a lot of times we send many of our devices to like tuv to and of course we have to send them quite a bit of money along with it right to to get all, and they do all the testing and verification of the things that, you know, we ask them, we want to make this one a category three device or a category four device or whatever. And they will do their due diligence and do the testing piece of it to verify that's the levels that we, that we had asked for. And it's there. We primarily work with TUV Rhineland and they actually review the design. They review our process to come up with the design. So it's more than just maybe like a, a quick failure test. They actually, it, it's a more rigorous process to have a product be TUV approved according to certain safety standards. So for anybody who hasn't met me, I am Eric Hanley. Uh, I am one of the two PLC specialists for electric supply and equipment. Um, so I cover the Apex and Rocky Mount branches primarily. Uh, but uh, for today, we're going to be going through a lot of the safety information. So we're going to go ahead and move straight into GuardLink and GuardMaster. To start out, we have a quick little video that is a instructional and intuitive video that kind of help lays out and gives you a general understanding of what GuardLink is. Hello, I am Sir GuardMaster. I'm here to grant you three machine safety wishes. How may I be of safety service? Well, hello, Sir GuardMaster. Uh, funny you should ask. I have always wished to connect up a bunch of different safety devices into one of these relays and still maintain high integrity in my safety design. Is that your first wish? Yes, I wish for lots of safety inputs. Ta-da! What do you think? Wow, nice demo. What do you call it? It's GuardLink. Notice the new DG safety relay, which stands for Dual GuardLink. Each relay can accept up to 32 safety devices in series per channel, so 64 total devices into one relay. 64? That is amazing! And exactly what I wanted. Can you mix and match the different type of safety input devices, such as e-stops and light curtains? Absolutely! Notice in the demo there is an e-stop along with two different types of door interlocks wired in series. The e-stop is an electromechanical device with dry contacts, while the door interlocks are electronic devices with OSSD outputs, just like a light curtain or laser scanner. When connected over GuardLink, these three components in series still meet the highest safety performance level of PLE. So how about that second wish? That's incredible. Okay, well since we're talking about safety relays, it would be nice to have easy wiring and visibly be able to see the status of each safety device. There is nothing worse than wiring a bunch of e-stops and door switches in series than having to try and troubleshoot which door is open or which e-stop is pressed. Ah, I know exactly what you mean. So is that a request? Yes. I wish for local indication. Perfect. 
Let there be local indication. Wow! Look at the light on these connection components. Those are called guard link taps. Notice the two green lights per tap. The one on the top shows the status of the local device, and the link symbol on the bottom shows if there is a break in the chain. Go ahead and hit the e-stop. Okay. Astounding. Check it out. Both LEDs went red on the e-stop tab, showing me the local device's status. And the other taps flash green if they're okay, but the link stayed red. Does it work this way on the uh, door switch here? This is amazing. How did you do this? Little voice of customer, a group think tank, and some amazing Rockwell automation engineers. The so final wish? Um, I guess if I was going to wish for them possible, it would be to allow this Gardling product to be capable of remote reset, the ability to lock and unlock guard locking devices through a network, remote troubleshooting, and full monitoring capability. Hold up. That is way more than one thing. You just listed off four more wishes. Sounds like some fancy diagnostics. No, yes. I wish for full diagnostics over Gardley. How did you do that? Sir Guardmaster, your safety relay just got a huge upgrade. Check this out. We have Ethernet comms going from the HMI to the PLC to our safety relay via this side Ethernet adapter. I can visually get indication of each device on the HMI remotely. And yes, I can even unlock the guard locking switch with the touch of a button. Open the door, close it, lock it. I bet you can even send all this data to your Rockwell Automation PLC to troubleshoot remotely and track the frequency each device is trip. Not to mention a remote reset on your HMI to the safety relay. This is unbelievable. Garlic allows for up to 64 devices to easily be wired in series. It meets the highest safety performance level of the safety rated devices, all the while providing local indication and remote diagnostics. Sir Guardmaster, you're amazing. All right, guys, I hope that showed uh, a pretty good uh, overview of what GuardLink is and how it works. Uh, we're going to go ahead and transition back into the PowerPoint where we can talk about what GuardLink is aimed to do. So GuardLink is really designed to help reduce the wiring effort by providing those standardized M12 connections onto all those individual devices. Plus it gives you that ability to send that data back just for diagnostic purposes. Uh, so it is not SIP safety, which we will be going through uh, later on today, but it does give you that local indication. So you don't need the additional diagnostics, but it gives you that capability if you wanted to get that diagnostics back to the PLC. So I just wanted to quickly go through and show how GuardLink works at a higher level. So GuardLink uses a individual channel of the safety relay to transmit unique safety data from each tap back into that individual device. It uses the secondary channel for that command lock and unlock functionality that they asked for as his third wish there, right? So it does utilize both channels on the dual channel 440R relays in order to give you that full functionality of the diagnostic information as well as the remote control. Here's just a quick synopsis showing the difference between the traditional T-TAP system that Rockwell has versus the upgraded GuardLink capability. And as you can see, the GuardLink has a 75% reduction in response time. So as you're designing your systems, you are now providing those standardized M12 connections plus a significantly faster system and Rockwell has the calculation there showing you how to get to that. Along with that time response calculation, when you are designing and implementing a guard link system, Rockwell has also provided a voltage drop calculator where you can put in how many taps and what the devices are. This is to help that validation and verification of your system to show that the guard link is achieving that level of performance that you deem necessary within your safety assessment. 
So to get that guard master diagnostic back, you use the 440 ethernet module, which is compatible with studio version 20 and newer. So you, it allows you to use the 1769 platform and the 1756 L7 platform with version 20 and newer. We'll go through some of the hardware more in a little bit. But the other thing is, is it still uses that same software, so Studio 5000. And we have two previews of what the add-on profile gives you. So you get the configuration shown on the right-hand side there. So that's where you set up the configuration of the module directly from the Studio 5000 platform, as well as the tags or some of the tags uh, that you get on those individual safety relays. So this last page here has a quite a bit of information, but there are two main points that we need to identify here. So we are showing in the top right corner that for each individual 440R Ethernet diagnostic module, you can have up to six relays, safety relays themselves. If you have existing relays within the field that are the older revision, so they'd be revision two, which have optical link 2.0, those must be placed on the right hand side. So if you are in the field and you are retrofitting a system to upgrade it and get that diagnostics through that ethernet module, you will have to make sure the older ones are on the right hand side in comparison to the revision three, which is optical link 3.0, which is on the left. So we show a diagram in the bottom right corner showing you that the optical link 2.0, where the two points are for that, as opposed to the 3.0, are the two smaller IR ports on the back side of it. So the, the optical link 2.0 is a slower bandwidth for data transmission and the 3.0 has through beams to allow that communications to go through uninterrupted, whereas the 2.0 does not allow that high speed transmission through. So that's why you need to have the newer ones on the left hand side. We'll just dive straight into uh, a look at uh, the SIP safety protocol. This is kind of going to be the, the main meat of our seminar today is the discussion surrounding integrated safety over ethernet. So why would you want to do safety over a network? Well, you, it's all the same reasons you use network communications in any other part of a manufacturing environment. You have increased flexibility, reduced cost, ease of use, easier to maintain and troubleshoot, easier to design and implement. So there's all kinds of benefits that we can gain from using safety over ethernet as well. So what are the concerns? What are the problems with using network? Networks for safety. Well, it's anyone who's used networks in an industrial environment knows that networks can be extremely unreliable. There can be things like noise and data corruption and devices that aren't supposed to be on the network coming on the network and causing problems, all kinds of issues associated with using networks. Normally what we, what we do is we say, well, the benefits sort of outweigh the cost. But in, in terms of safety, it's harder to say that when the consequence could be uh, either loss of life or injury, right? So then we get a little bit more concerned. Well, what I'm gonna show you is how safety over a network has been designed in such a way that it is uh, as reliable and safe as more traditional hardwired solutions. So ODVA is a communications standard company and they came up with a safety over a network protocol called SIP Safety. This is a certified network standard and it's been designed in such a way to maintain the safety integrity of safety applications. So how does this work? So what they do is they actually end up using the same physical layer and, and data link layers and transport layers for ethernet communication. So what that means is we can use all of the same hardware we're using today for other standard ethernet networks, but instead we're using them for safety applications. And the reason they can do that is because SIP safety only resides, only uses the application layer of the OSI model. So all of the underlying structure for the ethernet communications is, is exactly the same. So how does this work? When we, get it, when we send a, a safety signal from an end device to another device across the network, that safety information is then packed into an ethernet frame. The ethernet frame is sent across the network, just like standard, just like a standard communications happens. On the other end, it's unpacked out of the ethernet frame and then it's checked by the end device to verify that 
the data is correct, hasn't been corrupted, and it's still valid. And then that code is, is executed by the end device. So back to the issue of network reliability. What about network reliability? What, there's all kinds of issues that can pop up. An added layer of complexity is all of the other devices and different types of communications hardware that we use to communicate between devices on an ethernet network. You have different types of physical communications, fiber and standard copper. We have layer two and layer three switches for routing purposes. And there, there can be a whole slew of these devices in between in devices, even wireless communications as well. You know, this is a standard use for ethernet networks for networking. And we can, we can actually do SIP safety over ethern, over wireless as well. So what, what's the sort of solution to make Making a network of safety rated. Well, you could either make it redundant, so, so add lots of redundancy, add diagnostics, add uh, intelligence to all the devices in the network. The issue with this is it becomes extremely expensive and it's, and it's not practical. You're going to add way more cost to the network by creating a safety rated network. And so it just, again, now the benefits are not outweighing the, the cost. So what ODVA does is they actually distribute that intelligence, that diagnostics to the end devices themselves, and they utilize something called the black channel principle. What this is, is it assumes that the network, everything between the end devices is completely unreliable. They're assuming the network is completely unreliable and it places all the responsibility for maintaining the integrity of the safety functions on the end devices themselves. So how does this happen? So like we talked about it earlier, there's, there's lots and lots of different errors that can occur. And so what we do is we check for each one of those errors that can occur in, in the network. And we can detect problems that crop up and maintain safety by transitioning things into a safe state. So how does that happen? So when a, an error is detected, when a, when a problem with an ethernet packet is detected, the end device itself is responsible for transitioning into a safe state. So he throws up an error, a message error, right? And then transitions into uh, a safe state, whether that be safe torque off or whatever. And then um, uh, also what happens is all the other devices on the network are expecting information. So if they don't receive information from other end devices in a timely manner, or if devices do send back, hey, I'm, I'm in a safe state, now we, c we transition everyone to a safe state. All of this, like I said, all this has to happen within a predetermined time limit um, in order to maintain that, that safety integrity across the entire network. So let's take a little bit of a deeper look at these different types of er errors that can occur and, and how, how we actually mitigate each error, right? So we use something called a timestamp that is embedded in each data packet of communication. And what that allows us to do is it allows us to keep track of when the data was sent and when it arrives at its target device. So we can determine the age of information and verify that we're getting it in a timely manner. We are, we're using product identifiers on each data packet. So each end device has a unique product identifier and when it sends a packet of information across, that information has the product identifier from the end device it's coming from. So if a device on the other end receives information from a product that it's not supposed to receive information from, then we go into a safe state. We can detect that erroneous communications. We also uh, look for issues within the information itself. So within the, uh, along with sending unique identifiers and information across, we're also checking and cross-checking the information itself. So they use something called safety CRC, which stands for cyclic redundancy code. And what they do is they use that information to check for things like noise, bit flipping, data loss, dropped bits, all kinds of issues that can occur can be detected by the CRC. So all this redundancy and cross-checking, all these together are a diverse way of detecting many different errors. And we do it in such a way that we can, we can pretty much detect anything that can happen on an ethernet network. So let's take a little bit of a closer look at a timestamp and time expectation. So 
when a fir when a uh, data link first first is established between two two devices, there is a network offset that's determined um, via a ping, and that offset is used by the end device to de to uh, create a timestamp so that when that packet of information reaches the target device, the target device can say, hey, how old is this information? When was it, uh, when was it supposed to be sent? When did it arrive? And it can determine the age of the information. Um, so every single, like I said, every single packet of information has this timestamp and is looking for age, age and comparing to a pre-configured age limit. Uh, and then also this uh, offset is periodically uh, sort of reset, so they, they send out another ping to, to determine a new offset in case of things like clock drift within the um, end devices themselves. So what happens if a packet of information takes too long to get to the target? Well, there, again, the age is then compared to the age limit, the pre-configured age limit, and that information is determined to be too old, and then we transition into a safe state at that point. So let's take a, a little bit of a deeper look into the packets of Im information I've been talking about as well. So for shorter pieces of safety data, so less than two bytes of information, we actually don't use data redundancy. It's been determined that we don't need that level of redundancy for short pieces of safety information. But we're still using that cyclic redundancy code and we're still cross-checking it at the end devices to verify that we're getting, we're receiving valid data. Now that data is both uh, inverted for cross-checking and then it's also non-contiguous so it's in different segments of the data itself, the data packet itself, so that if there are issues in a particular part we can detect that as well. Now for longer segments of data what we're doing is, is actually we're using data redundancy and we're inverting the actual data that's coming, the safety data that's coming itself. For, so for safety information that's longer than three bytes, up to 250 bytes of information, we're actually using redundancy for that data as well as the CRC. And then just a quick look at the configuration and setup for these safety networks. So each safety network has something called a safety network number and it, this network number is unique for every single safety network. So if you get, if there's a device on another safety network that's trying to communicate with a safety network it doesn't belong on, then everybody's gonna go into a safe state because we're receiving information from something that is not on our network. We're also using password protection, configuration ownership, and configuration locking. So those are just, again, layers of, layers of protection, additional layers of redundancy and security to verify that we're only allowing certified people to uh, actually configure and edit and modify uh, the safety network itself. If you need more information or if you'd like more information, ODVA has a couple of white papers on the SIP safety standard. They're very thorough in, in, how, they, in how they describe the, the operation and functionality of, of the communications protocol. And then also, SIP safety has been uh, th certified by TUV Rhineland, which is a third party safety standards organization. So TUV has certified that this SIP safety networking standard is rated for up to the highest level, performance level E, for safety functionality. Um, there was a question in the chat saying, with a very bad network, could the error detection cause artificial stops? <laughs> Actually, yeah. Um, but the, the real question is, is should you have a real a good network in the first place if you're doing sip safety or non sip safety just for regular standard ethernet io you should have a solid network even without safety that solid network um you've got to have it out your io will will drop out your machine will stop but yes um there is the possibility of stopping your machine on a bad network and that's just indicative of having a bad network. So first thing, first priority is get your network nice and solid. Install it right, follow the CPWE um, um, guidelines that we have with Cisco. And once you've got the network in solid, clean, then you should not have any problems. Now that we've gone through the SIP safety, hopefully everybody gets a general understanding of how SIP safety works and 
does realize that SIP safety is safe. So like Paul was reiterating there that if you do have a bad network, it could cause you issues. But a lot of times that configuration, so the error checking on its end and uh, that configurable connection reaction time limit or the age limit that Henry was talking about does give you that ability to try and configure and, and help smooth out if you are having some of those nuisance trips. So the next topic we're going to go ahead and review are the various safety controllers that Rockwell offers that work with SIP safety to, to build that architecture. So if you are using SIP safety, you're going to need some sort of safety controller. So when we talk about safety controllers, we do want to highlight that there is not a separate controller from your standard processing unit. So it's an addition onto your standard processor. So you have your main processor that'll run your machine or run the process. And then on the side of that, you will have a safety controller built into that. So there is no extra time for data integration and that type work. Also with this safety network, uh, we do want to pull out that there are no uh, additional requirements. So the way that SIP safety has been designed by ODVA is it lives within the same network because it is packed in the same ethernet frame. Um, so you can have non-safety devices such as a uh, panel view or something else on the network that is not safety rated um, and still have your safety equipment, such as your safety PLC and safety IO on the same network. So both of those packets of information can be sent together with no crashing and no conflicts within your network. So there's no additional network design requirements when working with the safety controllers. And again, going back to that there is just the one controller, it also uses that same software platform. So you will have your standard program tasks and then with a safety controller, you get a safety task itself, which we're gonna cover in more detail later on. So with Rockwell, there are two primary platforms. So there's the compact guard logics and then the traditional guard logics or control logics guard logics. When we're talking about the compact guard logics, there are two families of processors. There is the 5370 or the more commonly referred to as the 1769 platform, which was the original compact logics release. That version only comes in a SIL 3 or performance level E rated environment, and it does not have any of its own local safety IO, which we will also cover later on in today's information. But the newer compact logics, which is the 5380 or more commonly referred to as the 5069, does have the newer technology. So it gives you that gigabit, plus it's got uh, four cores built inside of it to handle that safety. Um, which gives you scalability, which we're going to cover here in a few minutes. Outside of the compact logics, you have the two control logics or original guard logics controllers. So you have the 5570, which are the L7 processing units. The L7 processing units are only SIL3, the same as the 1769, and they do require a safety partner. So anytime you are working with that L7 processing unit, you will have to add a safety partner. Whereas the newer guard logics platform or the L8 processing units, you have that ability to have the controller or the controller with the safety partner. The controller will give you that performance level D or performance level E with the safety partner. And also highlighting, it is the newer platform again. So the L8 processors and the 5069 processors have those four cores. What that means for safety is there is an individual core inside there that's dedicated to safety. Plus there is a core still running your general process or your standard process. So you now have that ability to get a scalable safety level. So here we are showing the 5069, that is the performance level D rated controller. Um, so the performance level D is utilizing both of those processing units inside of the one uh, controller. If you wanted the performance level E, it will actually add a little bit of room. It is about a half an inch onto the side of that. 
What that does is it will integrate in a safety partner into the 5069 platform. What's not shown is the L8, which will have the processor by itself, again, giving you that performance level D or SIL 2 rating. And if you needed to have the performance level E or SIL 3 rated system, you would have to still add that process safety partner. We're gonna go ahead and move directly into the safety software. So the software utilized for safety is Studio 5000, which I alluded to earlier. So we're gonna go through a general overview of the software side of Studio 5000. And when we start talking about the safety specifics for the controllers, there is a really good reference manual that Rockwell publishes to help people when they are first designing and implementing these systems. So the reference manual is called out for the 5580 or the L8 processing units, as well as the 5069 compact logics. But it does still cover the older L7 and 1769 setups, which will discover and go through the different configurations for you within the controller, as well as the IO, and how to integrate other devices. So within that, reference manual, it gives you a lot of that general how to and where to find certain things within the software platform. And it also utilizes the appropriate instruction sets. But if you have never worked with or do not have an existing safety system, or you're attempting to modify one and you're not quite sure, Rockwell also gives you those safety functions. So this is something that Eric Bombier and Greg Taylor alluded to earlier. And in this, they give you safety function documents or what they call application techniques. So later on in our discussion, Henry is gonna go through and briefly show you a specific application technique when it is designed with drives and integrating SIP safety with the drives. But I do wanna show you up here that there are several different application techniques that Rockwell covers. And they cover access and door guard type situations. They cover e-stops, they cover hand controls, which would be your thumb buttons or palm buttons to verify the operator's hands are not within the dangerous area, present sensing, process related safety functions and subsystem functions. Within those functional documents, it is going to give you those code snippets and show you what the bill of material was, how to configure your controller and your IO to meet that specific performance level D or performance level E rated system and the code that Rockwell validates to say this will run that situation. So you may need to modify it slightly to work in your specific application, but it is well documented, well laid out, and gives you those validation and verification steps to say if you've made changes because your situation is slightly different than the Rockwell documented one, what do you need to do to validate and prove out that that system is safe and secure? Like we were talking before, the safety task is automatically generated when you are within a safety controller. So if you purchase a safety controller and you do not need the safety task or using that for safety to start. So you had a standard processing unit, you plan on developing or adding or integrating safety into your safety, but you have not done it yet. You do not need to add anything to the task. You can leave it empty and it will function as a standard controller. But as soon as you start adding code into that safety task, you will have to run through all those requirements and verifications to make sure that you are properly using that safety task. So when the safety task is created, it is made as a periodic task. You cannot delete or unschedule the safety task. So it is always assigned and the rate or the period scan for that safety task will also dictate your output scan rate or your RPI rate on your outputs. So you can manipulate your RPI for your inputs for monitoring purposes, but your outputs are always driven from that safety task. And the way the safety task functions is it will scan your inputs, it will take a frozen or snapshot image of that data, then it will run that task 
both on the standard processing unit as well as that safety processing unit. Both of those scans will execute in parallel and at the end of those, as long as they match up and verify and the results are okay, it will then and only then manipulate your output data, transform and change your output states. If the verification does not come out okay, it will put everything into a predetermined or pre-configured safe state for your system. Within the safety task, if you are in a SIL 3 or performance level E system, which would mean you have the slightly larger compact logics or the guard logics with the safety partner, you will need to add that safety partner and the safety partner will also add those two additional comparisons. So you're now running the code in three separate processing units. You have your standard process unit, your safety process unit, and now your safety partner. And the reason that you need to do that to achieve that performance level rating is to gain that additional diagnostic coverage and timing requirements that are needed for that higher criticality type system. So once you are within your safety task and you are working on developing your program and your routines, you will notice that the safety instructions are slightly different. So there are some that are the same as your standard instructions. And here shortly, we're gonna have Paul go through and show you just some of the differences and where you will see this type information. But when you're working with the safety instructions, we do want to highlight that the e-stop and light curtain, there are preferred instructions that call out specific functionality we always recommend you attempt to use those instructions. So in some of the older documentation, you will see the 1769 and 1756 L7 process units using a DCS, which is a dual channel stop function. So that function is made to be more configurable and it is an attempt to cover every type situation where you have that. So you have an e-stop or a light curtain or a door guard or gate switch type scenario. It can handle all of those. Whereas the preferred instructions are newer, better instruction sets that Rockwell has provided that still achieve that level rating, but they tend to be a little bit easier to implement for the end user. The same is said for the R out and CR out, which stands for redundant outputs and configurable redundant outputs. So when you add that extra configuration, it just adds one layer that you need to validate and verify to make sure your system is okay, whereas the redundant outputs removes a little bit of that burden on that specific programming instance that you have. Another common topic that we have to talk about when we're talking about safety is safety tag mapping. Natively, you cannot have a standard tag that will manipulate anything in your safety task. That is because the safety task is given a higher priority and requirements, right? Because it is safety, so we need to make sure that it is run at a separate level of complexity in comparison to the standard program. So if you need to get information from your standard program into your safety task, that is where the tag mapping happens. So a common instance for this would be a reset. So if you need to reset your system, the reset does not need to be safety rated. So you can have a physical reset push button located somewhere within your control system or on a remote panel, or you can have a HMI push button that is not a safety tag that you want to reference in your standard program to reset things in the standard program as well as your safety. In order to make that functionality happen, you need to map that safety information or that standard information into the safety program. The standard tags cannot drive any of the safety outputs, but if you do need to reference any of the safety inputs in your standard program, you can do that direction. So tag mapping is only to take information from your standard and move it into safety. If you ever need to reference safety, you can bring that into your standard, such as if an e-stop is pressed or a light curtain is down or something along that nature. You can always reference it that other direction. And Paul is gonna go through and show us how to get to that tag mapping and show us how he did his tag mapping later on. The other and last topic that we wanna go through is the controller safety tab itself. So the safety tab will show up if you have a safety controller. So the tab does not exist if you do not have a safety controller. But if you are utilizing a safety controller, you go to the safety tab and it will show you if the application is locked or unlocked. 
So that would add the password protection to your safety system. It'll also show you the safety signature. So the safety signature is critical because it's a unique identifier that means that your system, the configuration and program have been validated and are functioning as anticipated or based on your design. If the safety signature is applied, you can no longer make any edits to your safety task so no configuration changes and no code changes while online or offline. So the only way to make modifications once a safety signature has been generated is to delete the safety signature, make those changes. So if you are changing out IO cards or implementing new safety equipment, you'll have to delete that, make those modifications, validate and verify that that system is doing what you want, then reapply or regenerate a new safety signature to ensure that that whole safety system is running adequately. The safety run light will be a good indicator for you. So if you don't have the ability to connect to the PLC at the time, and you just want to verify that the safety signature still exists, you can quickly look at the front of the controller. And if the safety run status indicator is a solid green, it means that there is a safety signature and that that process is running as expected. So at this point, we're gonna go ahead and transition over to Paul Harrison, who you have briefly met with answering the other SIP safety question. And he'll go ahead and introduce himself and go through a quick software overview. Thank you, Eric. I appreciate the introduction. So my name is Paul Harrison. I work for Rockwell Automation. I'm a technical consultant on all the integrated architecture products, safety, networking, and software. And so I'm going to actually take you through just a high level look at navigating a Studio 5000 Logics Designer to basically show you what Eric's just been talking about on a live model. So when you program a standard controller, um, so just a regular um, compact logics or regular control logics, you get normal tasks. You get, if I look in my controller organizer, let's just, let's just give myself a bit of a, um, a zoom. So in my controller organizer, I've got my main task with my main program, my main routines, and you notice that this is what's familiar that everybody sees. But when you go to programming a safety controller, the program will actually give you that safety task automatically built that Eric was talking about earlier. And so in there, you can put your own routines and your safety logic. And so you'll notice that the safety task has got the little red icon and so have the routines. Whenever you're in one of your regular um, routines, so if I just go to my standard routine, it looks like normal logic. If I go to a safety routine, it looks just like normal logic, but in the bottom right-hand corner, there is a little guard at Buckingham Palace. So the guard at Buckingham Palace just says that you are editing in the safety routine or monitoring the safety routine. Another thing, when you go back to your main program, if you look at your instructions along the top, you'll notice you've got all your normal favorites, add-on, alarms, bit, time. You've got a lot of instructions, but there's nothing different because it's standard programming. So now I'm going to go into my safety logic. And now we'll notice at the top that the instructions have got little red icons again. So these have been safety certified for use in our safety programs. So now you've got safety, you've got bit, timer, counter, input, output, and all the rest. So big difference. Also, when you look at the controller, when you're online and offline, you'll see this safety unlocked. And if you go into there, you can actually lock and unlock the safety task to stop people from doing any modifications. Um, one of the questions the other day was, um, if you've locked your safety task, so you've verified it, validated it, everything's right working, can you modify any other program in that safety task? Well, no, you can't because it's locked down. The other question was, 
can you modify any of the program in your standard logic? And the answer is yes. The standard logic does your standard machine control and you can edit that, you can do forces, you can add, delete, replace rungs, do all the normal stuff with a standard controller. So let's have a quick look in the controller properties. And if we go to controller properties now with the safety controller, we've got a safety task, a safety tab, sorry. So let's have a quick look in there. And just like Eric showed earlier, you've got your um, safety application, you've got your lock unlock, you've got your signature you can generate. And also it tells you, and this was another question the other day was, um, how do you change, if you've got a compact guard logics, you can get a SIL, one, a SIL 2 version or a SIL 3 version. Well, now, um, how do you know which one you're going to be programming or how, how do you know how to change the program? So when you're offline, you can actually select if you're connected to a SIL 2 controller or a SIL 3 controller. Same for compact logics, same for control logics or guard logics. Um, the other thing on the screen is them safety networks that um, I think Eric talked about the networks. And so there's your network numbers. And so it gives you that information as well for the Ethernet cards, basically, for going out there. Let's have a quick look. We've got um, safety in, um, routines. We've also got in our controller organizer the I.O. configuration. So again, let's go into the I.O. configuration and zoom in. And we've got... Um, and a 5069 IB16F. You notice that the icon is grey. It's a regular standard input module. OB16F standard output module. But then we go down and we find this 442G. That's the MAB, um, which um, Henry's going to talk about later. And um, that's got a red portion of the icon. The light curtain on Ethernet, that's red icon. And then the PowerFlex 527 red. And then if we go down, we've got the IB8S, which is in the point IO group. So it's a point guard module. And the giveaway is S is for safety. No S is non-safety. And again, you'll see the red icon. So this is how you identify the modules you put them directly into your I.O. configuration, and then they will be mapped into the controller's tags, which are called backing tags. So let me just go up, and let's go to the controller tags. And you'll notice now under the class, you've got standard tags and safety tags. And as Eric um, talked about before, um, the standard tags can only be used in the standard, um, standard programming. The safety tags are used in the safety program. If you need a standard tag to, to operate something in the safety um, program, what you do is you do this. You go to logic, you go to map safety tags. And in this case, what we've done is we've used a dint, a 32-bit word, and it's called standard to safety. So each bit in there is a different function that we want to um, transmit over to the safety task. So that gets copied across to the safety to standard tag, 32 bits, and then that's used in the, um, in the safety task. And like Eric was saying, it, it, it freezes the inputs. It's a bit like when you did PLC5s and Slick 500s. Um, you add synchronous I.O. updates with the program. With the introduction of logics, it was asynchronous, so inputs could go on and off whenever through the program scan. Well, with a safety task, you don't want that to happen. You want to freeze the logic, so make it synchronous, the inputs, freeze that at the beginning of the program scan. You do your logic, make a decision, and then make, um, decide what to do with the outputs. So the dual channel stop. So let me go into here. And I'm just going to zoom in a little bit because my eyes are old. And this is the dual channel stop. Oh, by the way, if you're using Studio 5000 Logics Designer, if you go to Tools and you go to Options and you go to Display, you can turn on and off the instruction um, description. So the instruction description went off. I'm going to put it back on there, Apply. It just makes life a little bit easier for you when you're, um, 
when you're programming. So let me just um, zoom in again onto this dual channel stop. So I'm going to edit this rung so I can get to the safety function. So this says emergency stop at the moment. This is only a placeholder just to make it easier for you to understand what the instruction is doing. You can have it as a emergency stop, safety gate, light curtain, area scanner and so on. The instruction works the same way no matter what, it's just that you're giving it a legend, you're giving it a, a, a meaning in your program to help someone trying to debug the program. So let's just look at a, a regular IB16, uh, IB8C, right? So I'm going to double click, I'm going to look at the properties. And so you've got the properties here and you've got general, connection, module info and configuration. So just standard IB8 input. So I say OK to that. And now I'm going to go to an IB8S. And now you'll notice that we've got general connection, safety, module information, input configuration, and test output. So this is for the pulse tests when you're using a, um, a pulse test input or pulse test output. Um, so let's go and look at safety. It gives you your requested packet interval. It gives you your connection reaction time limit in milliseconds. And then it gives you the observed. So it actually tells you what it's seeing out there over the network. Um, it gives you your, um, um, if I go to advanced, it gives you a few other um, inputs that you can put in there to calculate your safety re um, time reaction, reaction time. So reset ownership, that's only basically if you take a module, so normally you'd get um, a safety module directly out of a box and it will not never been owned by a safety controller. When you put it in, you can actually, it will get the ownership automatically. But if you take one that's already had ownership and you put it into a system that's not, that's, that wasn't connected to that particular um, um, device, you've got to reset the ownership to let the new controller to take control of that particular device. So, like in the safety networks, you've got to say, my controller is talking to this device and no other device. If another device comes in who's got a different ownership, if it's over Ethernet, then you don't want that controller talking to that extra device. So reset ownership to allow you to connect it to a new owner. We're going to just dive straight in and start talking about uh, these safety over Ethernet devices. So starting with the uh, MAB, the multifunctional access box. So first, just to look at this device in general. It's been around for a little while. Why would you want to use this device as opposed to sort of everything separate? Well, instead of having to have, you know, a separate locking door switch, separate relays, separate push buttons, may, maybe have to even manufacture or, or machine your own handle, door handle, you've got it already sort of all integrated in into one package. You know it's a specific safety rating. It meets the performance level you're looking for. Rockwell has already certified this. They've, they've had it certified by a third party. So we know everything is going to function properly. And again, all of these items that you'll see on the MAB are configurable. So we can add and remove these push buttons, your e-stop, your door handle, your uh, locking mechanism. Every, everything is highly configurable. Configurable. But this is sort of the old way of doing it where we have everything is hardwired. So we have lots and lots of signal wires. I think it's like up to 26 signal wires that now you have to design in. You have to wire up for installation in the field. What we see instead now is with the new uh, SIP safety version of this uh, MAB, now everything is over Ethernet, right? So now we have diagnostics. Um, we have inputs um, uh, coming from the MAB. We have uh, e-stop capability. All of that safety and diagnostic information is over Ethernet. Again, you know, lots of configurable features. Here's a, a, an, an emergency egress handle. Uh, you can have this uh, configured on or, or remove it. Um, and then uh, we get indications from the lights, whether it be... Um, 
you know, just them lighting up themselves, we can program that in directly from the PLC. We don't have to have uh, hard wiring anymore. We get uh, indications about communications and what's going on, if there's errors and whatnot. Um, and then, uh, and then, you know, like we talked about as well, there's uh, lockout, tagout, lockout, tagout mechanisms um, uh, here as well that you can use. Um, but again, now we're reduced to power wiring and then uh, Ethernet. And then uh, also, uh, this is a, a dual redundant Ethernet setup, so we've got capability for either device level ring or um, linear topologies. What we see with the MAB over Ethernet is up to an 83% reduction in wiring. So all of that signal wiring for both safety and non-safety purposes is now all done over Ethernet on standard unmodified Ethernet. So that's the SIP safety integrated multifunctional access box. And then here's a look at the uh, configuration of the MAB. In Studio 5000, you've got an add-on profile. And again, you've got a whole slew of tags and diagnostic information for error detection and safety. The integrated safety MAB is only compatible with version 20 of Studio and later. Just a quick note there. Now let's take a quick look at the 450L Guard Shield SIP Safety Light Curtain. So just a little bit about the light curtain itself. This is a, a pretty unique product. It's, it's unique to Rockwell where they have interchangeable receiver and transmitter modules. So they call it a, a transceiver. These modules, you can purchase them and they're interchangeable. So you purchase the light diode module, the light beam module. You just buy two of them and you don't have to make sure you're getting the right part number. You don't have to worry about it when you're installing. Everything is plug and play. And then you've got plug-in uh, receiver and transmitter modules that plug in separately to these light curtains. But now, uh, along with this unique technology, we also have a SIP safety, brand new SIP safety version of this light curtain. So that's what we're going to look at briefly here today. And then just another quick note about uh, the capabilities of this light curtain we can get in terms of resolution we can go 14 millimeters for finger safe applications and up to 30 millimeters for hand safety applications there is a, an add-on profile in studio for it and we'll take a look at that as well for the sip safety version here's a look at the hardware the ethernet sip safety version of this light curtain this is really the main difference this device and then also the uh, the receiver plug-in module is, is the main difference from the discrete wired version. So now you've got, you plug, you still plug in your receiver and your transmitter to these M12 connectors. The receiver and transmitter have a different number of pins, so you can't get them mixed up. They, they plug in where they go. And then the transceivers, the, the light emitters themselves, are going to be interchangeable. So it, you just take the plug-in module and plug it into either one and you're ready to go. Then this Ethernet module also has dual redundant Ethernet capability. So we're all set for either device level ring or linear topologies for this as well. I think you'll start seeing that on pretty much every Rockwell device going forward is that dual redundancy. Here's a look at the receiver module, the plug-in module that I've been talking about. So this is the main component here. So this is where you set your IP address for the SIP safety light curtain. You can use these rotary dials or again you can use boot P or the RS Links utility as well if you have something other than 192.168.1 as your subnet, but you just set these rotary dials and then you're all set, ready to go with your IP address. Here's a look at the software, the add-on profile, all the tags that are associated with the light curtain. This is a brand new product, came out at the end of last year, so you're going to probably see more updates and more changes to, to improve functionality and diagnostics going forward. Just a look at the light curtain itself. Um, so. Uh, again, here's that Ethernet module with the M12 plug-in connectors. We've, we've actually got um, Ethernet coming from, uh, a, from further up the line, and we're sending it down the line, right? Um, and then here is that plug-in device, and this just, uh, it's, it's got two screws that you unscrew and just pull it out, and uh, again, plug-and-play. Um, They've got uh, the light curtains themselves have diagnostics 
a, just a, a light level of di visual diagnostics. It tells you, you know, whether or not you've, you've broken the beam or not. Um, it tells you if you're on a particular segment. So there's two segments on this. So it'll tell, it lights up depending on which segment I have broken. Um, and then if I cover the whole thing, I lose all, all segments, right? And then there's also um, on the top uh, of these light curtains, there's a, uh, a synchronization beam. So if I break that synchronization beam, uh, I'm, I'm going to lose communications entirely between the devices. So they actually use that synchronization beam to communicate with one another and uh, verify that, that uh, they're operating properly. Um, but uh, that's important to know for uh, for muting applications. You know, if you have uh, a, an application where you have something that's going to pass underneath and you want to mute that segment, um, you wouldn't be able to have that, for instance, you wouldn't be able to have these mounted upside down because then you'd break that synchronization beam, right? Um, and then uh, also they have these, these nifty uh, laser arrays that are available for aligning uh, the curtains themselves. So you just put your finger on the little photoreceptor button and it lights up your aligning array and it's uh, very easy to, to get these guys installed and aligned properly. Just a quick look at that array just to give you an idea of how, how that works and then and then the synchronization beam as well. These devices uh, like I've been saying they're plug and play. You can unplug the old discrete version and field upgrade these modules to the Ethernet SIP safety version of these light curtains. That's a great feature. Now you do have to make sure that you are firmware revision 5.001 or higher in order to make that upgrade in the field. Now Rockwell does have a program for grading. If you have an older version, they can they'll that will work with you to to help you get the discrete version upgraded to the SIP version as well since we need to replace the curtains themselves but if you're firmware 5 or higher you can just buy the plug-in module and you're ready to go and then in rs logics our before version 24 you won't be able to use the sip safety version you have to be 24 and higher and then if you use version 32 of logics or below down to 24 then you're going to have some configuration and programming limitations as well there is a program that we have uh, if you're uh, an older version than 5 and you want to upgrade your device from discrete to SIP, uh, we can help you with that. Just reach out to us and we'll help you out. Well, we'll move on to a look at some of the advanced safety features of Kinetics and PowerFlex drives. Before we dive into that, I want to talk a little bit about this evolution of these drives. Things are growing more integrated in general, not just with networking, but we're actually seeing safety devices sort of be built into devices like drives and, and motors now. So now because of these, of all of this uh, effort to integrate everything and make it more seamless, we're able to emit whole entire electromechanical components from our safety system because they're already built into the equipment that we're using. And so we're able to get more out of our devices with less equipment and hopefully less money, definitely less engineering effort and design effort. So before we dive into those functionalities, the advanced features, wanted to briefly go over these safety functions and safe monitoring requirements that are laid out in IEC 61800. So these are uh, well-defined safety functions. They have specific ways that they're supposed to be implemented and used for particular applications. And again, the IEC standard is very clear on the way that you're supposed to use them. So here's just a list of all the all these functions that we're going to be talking about, so these safety monitoring and stopping functions. And so what you need is spe specific, special, or, or safety specific tools and design practices in order to implement this these functions properly. So the way we did that in the past was by using these advanced safety relays. Um, this is the MSR 57P as an example for uh, either safe speed or safe position monitoring. We've got an encoder input that has a reduced in terms of complexity because now we've got an RJ45 plug-in, right? But 
but we still have lots and lots of wiring and signal uh, information going in and out of the relay to make the function, the safety function that we're trying to get, work properly. And, and in order to meet those best practices and standards laid out by IAC. Now, instead, with SIP safety, with the SIP safety integrated safety that we're talking about, now our topology looks a lot simpler, uh, a lot more straightforward. Now we're just talking about Ethernet communications between devices. So in this example, you've got a Kinetics 5700, an ERS4 version of the Kinetics 5700. Now for these advanced safety features, for safe safety monitoring features, uh, like safe limited speed and safe position. You need the ERS4 version of the Kinetics 5700. For lower things, if you only need to do, for instance, safe torque off over Ethernet, you can use the ERS3 version. Now for the 5500, there's the ERS2 version of that drive that can do safe torque off over Ethernet, but the 5500 cannot do these advanced safety monitoring functions, only the 5700 can over Ethernet. And then another thing you, just to, to uh, highlight is the VP series motor that we're using in this example it has a SIL2 PLD rated encoder installed in it. So that's a special configuration that you need to make sure that you have for these safety monitoring function. And then be monitoring the speed of that motor before you're allowing access from with the MAB. And we're doing all that over Ethernet. Got all kinds of diagnostics and whatnot. Here's another example. Same type of application. Maybe we're monitoring the speed of this motor, but now we're using a PowerFlex 755. So this is a safety specific card that you have to install in the 755 the 2750S4 module in order to get access to these advanced safety functions over Ethernet. Quick look at the brand new SIP safety encoder as well. So this, this encoder, well, it's about a year old now, came out in the end of 2019, but this is a scenario where we're using a PowerFlex 525 drive and it's hardwired safe torque off. If you want uh, safe torque off over Ethernet with the 500 series PowerFlex drives, you got to have the 527. So in this example, we have a 525 hardwired safe torque off, and we can reach PLE, the highest level of safety with this system, because now we're actually monitoring the load itself. We're monitoring the speed of the load, and so we'll do a safe torque off, the drive will start ramping down, but now we're making sure, verifying that we're getting down to a safe speed before allowing access to our machine. And so uh, all of these functions that I've been talking about, all of this functionality has pre-built, pre-engineered, certified building blocks in RS Logix 5000. So each function has a function block that will also help you implement these safety functions without having to rebuild things from the ground up and without having to know every last detail of the code. So let's take a look at some of these. So first of all, to use these safety functions, you need to always use this safe scaling function block. So the data coming from your drives and motors, things like position and speed, that information has to come through one of these safety scaling function blocks in order to be used in the safety functions that we'll look at in a minute. Just to note that, and, and I think Paul will look at the configuration of this in a little bit with the demonstration, but just to note that uh, and highlight that you need to make sure you're using this safe scaling function block. Here's a look at some of the function blocks themselves, how they're used, what they look like when they're being implemented, and then again, just a little highlight, make sure that you're using that safe scaling function block for these guys. So I'm just gonna go each, through each one of these really, really fast uh, and, um, and just describe uh, the different functionalities of these safety functions. So for safe torque off, all we're doing is we're removing energy. We're, we're taking current off of the power, off of the cables going to the motor, and we're removing energy, and we're assuming that we're ramping down to a safe speed. So you might have like a timer or something in there before you allow access to an unsafe area. But basically we're assuming that when we hit safe torque off, we're at a safe state. A safe stop one, now we're actually monitoring the deceleration 
of the active deceleration of that motor, right? So now we're making sure that we're ramping down the motor before we're allowing access. And at the end of the safe stop one function, we're going into safe torque off. So we're removing that energy at the end, and now we're no power. Safe stop two is same as safe stop one, except for instead of going into safe torque off, we are simply monitoring the speed, making sure that the motor is staying at a, a low or a safe speed or, or zero speed. And then for a safe operating stop function, so now we're gonna actually monitor the whole entire profile, so both speed and position to make sure that we're maintaining a specific deceleration profile and we're actually getting into a specific position as well. And if we deviate from any of that, any of our predetermined limits, then we're gonna go into fault and we won't allow access to the machine. Here's a safe brake control function. So in this case, we are actually going into safe torque off, but we're engaging an auxiliary safety brake. So this isn't the installed holding brake that's on the back of your servo motor, right? This, this will be an, a separate and auxiliary safety brake that's designed for stopping the application. It's designed for stopping the load. So we would engage that and stop the motor manually uh, as a means to put the machine into a safe state. Here's some of the safety monitoring functions, more advanced. So here's a safe limited speed function. So now what's happening is when we go into, we request access to the location or request that we move into a safe limited speed mode. And so what happens is the motor is going to go down to that safe limited speed. And then we're going to continuously monitor the speed to make sure we're not going above our, our pre-configured speed limit. If we do, we're going to fault out. But so that's this is just a continuously monitored limited speed. And then here's a safe limited position function. So it, this is similar to the to the limited speed, except for now we're monitoring position. So we're making sure that our axis is staying in a specific place. So if you think about an application like something that has knives or something dangerous sticking out, so maybe we need to move those knives away from where the operator is going to be standing and maintain that safe position so that the operator is not in danger of being injured by the machine. Safe direction, in this case, we're making sure that our direction is staying in what we've predetermined to be a safe direction. So think about like a nip roll application. So if you've got two rolls that are opposing each other and if they're rolling towards each other, then they might pull an operator in and cause injury that way. So what we would do is you operate it with a safe direction function and maintain a an outward movement so that instead of pulling the operator in, you're always gonna be pushing them away. You might see this in calendaring or, or printing presses, things like that. Just to give you a little bit more detail, I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this, but just picking out this safe limited speed function and to show you guys as well, remember we, we've been talking about this website, machinesafetysolutions.com. So on this website, there's a whole slew of pre-engineered safety functions. So I'm going to show you one that is picked straight from the website. So here's the application technique, and I just want to show you how detailed they get. So it, sh it shows you devices that, that you can use this function with. It shows you what level of safety you're going to get to, right, if you use this, if you use this application technique. It shows you uh, a wire, wiring diagrams, right? So here, here's wiring diagrams on uh, how exactly you're supposed to wire this function, right? Um, f configuration. Uh, it even it shows you how you need to configure each device that you're uh, that you're using, and then it even gives you as much detail as to show you um, ladder logic, specific uh, code on how exactly you're supposed to uh, write the the ladder logic for this functionality. And I just want to re-highlight something that Eric and Greg mentioned earlier. This. Uh, this attachments window here. So there's a little paper clip over here on the left left hand side of the Adobe screen and there's all kinds of files here that are attached to this application technique. Even ACD files. So they've got code written for you. All you've got to do is open it up and look at it. And just just so you know as well, so here is a validation checklist. After you implement the function, what you would do is you would use this validation checklist to validate that you're operating 
the function proper, that everything is operating the way it's supposed to be, that you've implemented it properly, and this validation checklist will help you make sure that you've done everything correctly. Now, we're gonna move into a, an integrated safety system demonstration with Paul Harrison. So, I've got Studio 5000 Logix Designer already online to my control system. Also, I'm using a thing called um, Type VNC that's connecting to my HMI. And one of the questions the other day was, what kind of HMI is this? And um, it's not a PanelView Plus. We're actually using the PanelView 5000 family. This is a 5510. And Type VNC allows my computer to go online to this HMI, and I can remotely do some functions on the drives, systems, I can reset, I can stop, I can start and make things happen. And if you notice on the screen, I've got the, um, the trend. So this trend is showing me that I'm running at 20 revs per second, that's my line speed. And I've got a few other things on here. There's a safety reset, there's a safe stop one, there's a safe limited speed request, and then there's a safe limited speed select. And the purple line is whatever level you set in your program for that. So, um, I'm gonna just stop my drive at the moment. You can see a nice normal stop. So I'm just gonna go back to my software for a second. And um, we talked about the, um, the instructions there was a dual channel stop. So I've got these two inputs coming in from my e-stop. And my e-stop is on the front of my uh, drive panel. So I'm just gonna press the button and you'll see that the two inputs go to zero and the output for the DCS, the dual channel stop, goes to off. I reset that by pulling it out and my output comes back on because my safety e-stop has been reset. If we also look at any of the other parts of the software, let's just have a quick look at um, let's just go MAB. He's got the same thing. So what we do is we now use these instructions for each safety device. So if I've got a safety device coming in on um, Ethernet, like from the MAB, I can use a dual channel stop for that C stop. Um, if I've got a safety device like an E stop going into like a, a point IO or point guard IO, I can use the dual channel E stop, um, dual channel stop to, to, to register that. So a lot of nice things in there that you can use. I'm just going to go back now to my um, software, to my HMI. So I've got, I, I talked about earlier in my, uh, when I did the software overview, we talked about basically I've added a bunch of safety devices into my controller organizer. So let's have a quick look at these safety devices. So I've got a PowerFlex 527, which is on Ethernet. And that guy is a safety device. It can do safe talk off over ethernet. Um, I've got the 442 MAB, and that's got the input switches, the e-stop, the door. So if I press request entry, I can actually go in. All this is over ethernet. You just give it 24 volt power supply, and then it comes all the way back to the controller. I've got my e-stop that's connected into my um, point guard I.O. And I've got my safety drives, which are my Kinetics 5700 ERS4. I've got a gate monitoring and locking switch, so I can't get into there, or I can if I've got my request to enter. And then inside here, I've got a servo motor. And on the back of that servo motor is that SIL2 rated encoder that um, Henry was talking about earlier. Also up here, I've got a SIL2 rated motor on this load. Um, I've got a gate switch on my door. And then there's a couple more things. Henry talked about the, um, the SIP safety encoder. Nice little encoder. Um, 
This is great if you want to take your level from PLD to PLE. In this case, we're on PLD because we're using a PLD safety controller. We're using um, only one encoder per axis to tell us the speed and position safely. But if I wanted to make this to um, a PLD, uh, to a PLE, I would actually add the encoder to the end of one of the axes. It'll give me a second feedback, um, one on the load, and that gives me a better classification of safety. And then here is a snippet. It's just a little taster of what's coming out soon in stores near you is the new Rockwell Automation Z Safe Zone scan 3 scanner. It's basically an infrared laser scanner for if you walk into an area, you want the machine to say, oh, oh, there's somebody in the area, slow down. Um, and then if they get too close, stop the machine, depending on how you program it. So this is the safe zone scanner that will be in shops soon. Right, so let's go through as if I'm an operator on this machine. So back to my panel view, I'm just gonna reset and I'm gonna be the operator saying, let's start the system and ramp it up to 20 revs per second. That's my line speed. So now if an operator says, oh right, I want to stop the line, he just presses the stop and you'll notice that it, the speed ramps down at a nice smooth ramp. So I'll do that again, start up. But now we'll talk about the safe stop one. It's like an e-stop basically. Whenever there's a problem in the machine and the operator says, oh, I want to stop this as soon as possible, um, he either hits the safe stop one on his, on his HMI or he can press an e-stop on one of his operator panels. So I press the, the safe stop one and if you notice, the trend has got a more aggressive deceleration because we want to stop it quicker. So I shall pull that guy back out. Oh, and by the way, while I'm doing that, I'm going to press him back in. You'll notice on the HMI screen, we have got e-stop one, and there's a little number of 44. I've put a counter in there because all these um, tags are information enabled. So that means you can bring that back from your devices to your controller, from your controller, and you can program that into your HMI. So that's really good because now you've got some a bit of analytics there going on. If somebody keeps pressing and resetting e-stops and nobody can see them doing it, you can actually put counters in there. And for operators purposes, you can put annunciation on the panel saying, hey, you can't reset it. So if I try to reset this guy, I can't reset it because I've got an e-stop one pressed. Let me press e-stop two and I get the counter for e-stop two as well. So now I'm going to reset these and then I'm going to reset from my control panel. Now my e-stop's ready. You notice that the safe talk off disappeared. I can start again and run. So safe stop one. The next one is basically um, doing a safe limited speed. So just say the operator, the machine's running and something gets um, snagged up or he needs to go in to do some minor servicing for instance like greasing while the thing's running at a low speed so what he does is he requests access to the machine and it should go to the speed of the selected safe limited speed so I'll press my safe limited speed so my enter request it goes down to to a slower speed, it's below the purple line, so it's below the limit. You heard some clicking, and you should see on your display, guard doors unlocked. So now the guard doors are unlocked, I can now go in and do my minor servicing, and the machine still runs. So, safe speed monitoring is what it says. It's not control, it's monitoring. So what it does is it basically says, right, you put some parameters into my program, my safety program that says, if you go into safe limited speed, we're going to monitor, the safety system is going to monitor the speed of the application or the, the system. 
And if it tries to go above that safe limited speed when the operator's got it in that function, it's going to stop the system and put it into a safe torque off and make it nice and um, nice, nice and safe for the operator. So I'm just going to do a little um, um, jiggery pokery with this. I'm going to actually go into a jog. And I'm going to try to jog the machine. Now, this could be done by someone programming, or it could be done by someone uh, by by the program not being checked out properly, and it inadvertently tries to jog the machine while the operator's got it in safe limited speed. So I press jog forward. I tried to go above the speed, and now you've noticed that everything has stopped. And another thing is, is it unlocks all the doors. Um, so all it's doing really is it's just stopping the system saying hey if something's happened inside and it, if somebody's inside and it tries to go faster safe limited speed is going to stop the machine and make it safe again so let's put ourselves back together again let's press our resets let's start the system up again and right so my machine's running and the operator sees something happen oh and he says, oh, I need to stop this system. So when I've done a safe stop one, the machine has stopped. Safe talk off is active, right? Should I be able to get inside this machine? I think not. Because we've not requested access to the machine. So all you've got to do is press request access. Because it stopped, you should be able to go into the machine and do whatever you need to do. So I'm going to reset, and now I'm going to start up again. So just say the operator or a maintenance guy is inside the machine, and somebody closes the door, resets everything, and then says, oh, it started up, and the guy's inside, and he tries to get out. Well, all the doors are locked. So on the MAB, we have a, another function. We have a, what's called a, an emergency egress angle, handle. So basically, I grab that. It opens up. It stops the machine. It opens up all the doors as well, just in case that operator was injured. Um, and people need to get in from different access points to help him out or her out. So that's the, um, that's the emergency egress angle. And what it's doing is it's actually enunciating the gates open. It's actually enunciating both gates are open if I open them. But at the bottom of the screen, I've put get to MA, um, 442G MA default forced machine exit. So now it's telling you, and you can record this, you can use it in your logic to say, hey, someone was stuck in and they had to get out while the machine was running or enabled. Yep. reset and everything goes back to normal the 5700 ERS 4 it's got a safe talk off hardware connection and so you can do hardwired or you can do safe talk off over Ethernet it's either or you cannot use both um, same with the PowerFlex 527 you can do hardwired safe talk off or over Ethernet if you had a Kinetics 5500, you'd get two flavors of the 5500, ERS2 or the ERS. The ERS is hardwired safe talk off. The ERS2 is over, of safety over Ethernet. The PanelView 5000 is a new family of PanelView that Rockwell's come out with. Um, we have the PanelView Plus, which is the latest one, is the PanelView Plus 7, and that is a Windows CE box and it uses Factory Talk View ME Studio, uh, Studio ME, to program it. And that guy um, connects to your controller. It can connect to any controller, basically. With the PanelView 5000, which is, on this case, is a 5510, it's Ethernet, but it's purely for connectivity to Logix controllers, compact or control Logix, not to any MicroLogix or PLCs or SLC 500s. But the beauty of this one is it has inbuilt diagnostics. And these automatic diagnostics automatically come from the PLC directly to the panel view without you doing any programming. So, Eric, could you just put the 
PLC into program mode, please. So he puts the kit switch into program. And then let's have a quick look on the display. And you see on your panel view, this triangle's come up. And it tells me that the controller has gone into program. Put it into the REM, REM position. So it should now show, yeah, remote program. And now put it into the run position. So now it's back into run. And put it back into the REM position so it should report, show remote run. Okay. This diagnostic is perfect. It comes up automatically. It's built into Panel View 5000. And so you don't have to do any programming. So with the new Panel View 5000s, um, you can actually use diagnostics that are automatic coming from the controller. Also, you can use um, what we call factory talk alarm and events. So any alarms that are built inside the controller will automatically populate the, the panel view itself. You don't have to program anything into the, the um, panel view. Yep. OK, so we do have one question from the audience. So Adam asked, is it possible to attach the safety checklist to the safety signature? And Adam, I'll go ahead and answer that question for you. So the uh, safety checklist cannot be assigned to the safety signature itself. But the newer Logix controllers, as long as you are into Logix Designer, does give you the ability to attach files into the program itself, right, or into the controller to store that uh, checklist file. So if you wanted to do it that way, you could store it within the controller, but it is not necessarily assigned specifically to that checklist or, or the safety signature itself. The last discussion we're going to have is specific to the I.O. So Rockwell has several different I.O. platforms, and we're going to go ahead and cover those for you. So Rockwell has five primary safety I.O. platforms. So they have the 1756 uh, Control Logix platform that now allows you to use local I.O. They have the 5069 Compact Logix uh, safety I.O. that is local or remote. You have the 5094 uh, Flex 5000 uh, safety I.O., which is made uh, for distributed applications. And then you have the point I.O., which is the uh, safety I.O. that Paul had in his demonstration. So the point I.O. has been around the longest as far as the safety goes. And then the final and fifth option for I.O. on Rockwell is the armor block. The armor block I.O. is designed for those on-machine or in-machine applications such as robot cells or on a robotic arm or something along that nature, or just somewhere where you need to have that I.O. located within a piece of machinery, as opposed to all of the rest of the platforms are geared towards an in-cabinet or in some enclosure type application. So we're gonna go ahead and review some of those enclosure type applications and show just the relative size versus point density. So at the top of that list there shown is the 5069 platform. So based on point density and size, the 5069 is the smallest form factor while being the most capable or performance level IO that we have. The next form factor down would be that point IO. And then the bottom two are our higher point density applications, which would be the Control Logix or the Flex 5000 IO. Just a few key features and where and why you would look at the different applications or different safety IO applications that we have. The 5069 is that high performance, so it gives you that gigabit speed across the network, as well as it uses Ethernet communications on its backplane to get that safety diagnostics information back to the controller as quickly as possible. So it is really designed for that machine focus or that small footprint type area where you don't have a lot of room, but you need to get some safety IO in there. The Flex 5000 IO is really geared towards our distributed applications. It is our most versatile line of safety IO, and it does have the ability to go into more harsh environments with uh, extreme temperature applications. 
And then the last one we have is the control logics. And we, we call it the integrated architecture because if you already have an existing control logics chassis, you can now install the safety IO with the local IO. So previously you had to have a distributed usage of the uh, 1756, but now it is compatible within the same chassis as standard IO and the processing unit itself. So we have just a quick chart here going through the various applications, but the most important line in this whole thing is just the IO module availability. So the 5069 compact logics and the 1756 control logics both only have digital input and digital output modules available. The older platform, the 1734.io, has an analog input in addition to those digital ins and digital outs. And then again, showing that the Flex 5000, the 5094, is our most versatile, where it has the digital inputs, digital outputs, and relay outputs. And they are adding or planning on releasing the analog input and analog output safety cards here in the near future. So when we're talking about the newer platforms, that is gonna be the Flex 5000, the 5069, and the 1756. All of those input modules run at a six millisecond scan rate or have the ability to run at a six millisecond scan rate and the outputs run at a four and a half millisecond scan rate. In comparison to the older Point IO and Armor Block modules, they run at 16.2 millisecond input rate. So when you're trying to get that enhanced speed or diagnostic coverage, the newer platforms just are more reliable and faster so you can get to that better platform. Control Logics has two primary flavors again, like we said. So the digital input is a uh, 16 channel input. We're not gonna go through all the various things, but again, it is new that it now allows it into the local chassis. And then it has the eight output module. This is in comparison to the 5069 platform, that compact logic. So the smallest form factor that we offer. In the small, the 5069 small platform allows you to work with a performance level two SIL D or a performance level E SIL three type environment. And that is strictly based off of the configuration of your individual card setup. For 5069, it is only an eight input and an eight output. Lastly is the 5094 that we're gonna go through here. So just showing again, the 5094 is our highest point density, having 16 in, 16 out, or that four relay output module. So the relay output module is to allow you to potentially remove some of those additional relays that you would have to have in a higher current rating requirement. So the output card for the 5094 gives you a two amp maximum output for the four channel configuration of 24 volt DC or 120 slash 240 volt AC applications. So sometimes you will no longer need those 100S or some other safety rated application relays, but you have to verify that you're within the current draw rating. If you do need a little bit more current draw, you can set up the four relay into a two channel only, which will boost your current rating up to that four amp. But it only works with the 24 volt DC at that four amps. You lose the 120 volt AC capability. Last, as Paul went through and alluded, we're gonna highlight a few new things that come out with those three new platforms. So with the new ones, they have added this add-on profile and Within the new add-on profile, you can get to enhanced diagnostics at each individual point. So the point IO and the older modules do not have this point diagnostics. They will give you diagnostics based on the card. So the card will notify you that there is a fault within the card, but it won't give you that individual point diagnostics. To get to this point diagnostic though, you must be online with a controller in order to get that tab to show up. So if you're not online, you will not be able to click on the diagnostics tab. So if you're in the middle of configuring or changing and you try and click on it, nothing will happen until you go online with the controller. And then we show on the right hand side what the screen looks like when you do that. So it gives you that if the individual point is faulted, if it's shorted out or is having a temperature fault or anything like that. 
So with that advanced diagnostics, they have also mapped several of those tags and the majority of those tags back into controller tags within the add-on profile. Not all of the tags are created for each of the individual points. So you will have to verify which card you're using and what tags are available based on that card selection. So they are slightly different based on that add-on profile. They have been making revision changes to make that more universal and across the platforms, but they have not completely made that 100% the same between the three different platforms being the 1756, 5069, and 5094. Our last screen here that we're gonna cover is just some of the IO configuration that is specific to safety. So Paul was able to show you within the software how to get to this information, but we're gonna go a little bit more into depth and just quickly describe why there are some of these configuration changes. So on the input modules we have it shown on the left-hand side, you have the ability to change the point mode. So there is safety versus safety with pulse test. So safety is geared towards OSSD devices. So OSSD devices are becoming more popular, such as light curtains and proximity sensors. OSSD devices do their own pulse testing and their own diagnostics. So the controller IO card no longer needs to provide that feedback because the end device itself has that diagnostics built into it and it just will portray that information back to the controller through the OSSD itself. Whereas if you are in a dry contact or something similar to an e-stop circuit or a pull cord circuit, you will have to do a pulse test across those contacts in order to verify that that system is still safe. So that's where those two configuration changes come into play. If you are working with the pulse test, there is one key thing to point out. There are only four test sources to provide that pulse test but the sources there are actually eight outputs on your card that is designed so that one test source will check two channels so you can assign one test source to two separate input points if you are utilizing your test outputs then you have a separate tab that you can go to which is the test output points tab within that tab you have three options for configuration you have none which means you are using safety, you are not using the safety with pulse test. Or you can use pulse test, which is the most common. And again, that one is used for your contact type circuits. And the third one is power supply. So power supply was initially intended to allow you to provide power to the OSSD devices that are configured as the safety point mode. The power supply is not the most common usage. I would typically recommend if you are looking to use your input card to source power to the OSSD, you need to verify that the card can supply the adequate amount of power to that end device. Otherwise, you could potentially overload the card and cause issues with your system. So most of the time, we still see that people will use the test outputs as pulse test only. And then if you have an OSSD device, they will externally source that 24 volt power to that OSSD device. So moving over to the output modules, which is on the right hand side, the output modules have a little bit less configuration requirement, but there are two point types that you can set up for outputs. You can have a single or dual channel output style based on which performance level rating and configuration you need is what that will end up being for you in your situation. Most common will be the single because people want to be able to configure them individually for your simpler circuits, especially in a performance level D environment. Almost everybody's going to use those single point types, but again, it's, it's specific to your application. Then there's also the point mode, and this is similar to the point mode of the inputs where you have safety and safety with pulse test. Uh, but this one is again going to be tied back to which performance level or SIL rating are you attempting to get to. So for a performance level D system, it is not always a requirement to have pulse test on your outputs. So if it's not a requirement, people will typically not add it because adding more complexity makes it sometimes more difficult to troubleshoot and find where your issues are coming from. So again, those are all the outputs are all defined based on your system requirements, which you should identify doing a safety assessment to verify what you're trying to do. So at this point, 
we have concluded the majority of our content. ESNE has been working to develop a YouTube page where we have been creating and making a lot of tips and tricks and how-to videos. So we are publishing new information to that at a frequent basis. Please check that out. It'll help you guys, especially if you have some starter or startup questions where you're just unfamiliar with the topic. Sometimes we'll run through various opportunities for you guys. And that YouTube page is ESECO TV. We appreciate that everybody joined today. Thank you again, and y'all have a good day.